Welcome back to Shannon's Club TV, the program celebrating cars in Australia for their achievements on the road and in competition. In each episode, we examine the defining points that made our feature car stand out and take an up-close look at an owner's example. We'll also get some expert advice from the Shannon's auctions team on what to look out for. So let's kick off today with the popular 1980s model range, which did not need a V8 to consolidate Ford's market leadership, the XF Falcon. The XF was the second facelift on the 1979 XD Falcon. Hindsight clearly shows that it was the XD that set Ford Australia on its trajectory to market leadership. The 1982 XE boasted a number of significant advances, chiefly a brilliant Watts Link 6 Link rear suspension, Weber carburetor and a five-speed gearbox option. There was a really great Australian road car in the XE range, the ESP. Sadly, when the XF, codenamed Redwood, arrived in late 1984, the ESP was no longer on offer. The V8s had already gone and Ford Australia probably saw little point in offering the ESP only as an EFI 6. Ford Australia had already enjoyed market leadership for two and a half years, so perhaps a halo variant didn't seem essential. But the VK, the first Commodore with an injected engine option and boasting a new six window design, was pushing Holden's numbers closer to Ford's. And the Holden 5 litre V8 was in great demand. Mark, without a V8, there was never likely to be an XF racing in Group A, was there? No, exactly right. But look, even if it did have a V8 in the range, Ford had no interest in homologating the Falcon for Group A touring car racing because, of course, it had advanced plans for global domination with a turbocharged version of its Ford Sierra. Even so, the XF Falcon did compete in some other categories, which I'll get to a bit later. The XF's facelift was compromised. Where the XE looked integrated, the XF's rounded nose and lower bonnet line were at odds with the rectilinear tail with its Fisher Price fussiness. Inside, the all black dashboard had been ditched for a redesigned colour keyed panel. Faddish digital instrumentation appeared in the Fairmont gear, Fairlane and LTD. The binnacle pod with its touch buttons for assorted functions was very Mazda 929, reminding us that Ford Australia and Mazda were closely involved. All variants acquired additional standard kit. The Fairmont gear was the greatest beneficiary with cruise control, trip computer, fast glass, central locking and so-called premium sound system. The upgraded EFI engine jumped from 111 to 120 kilowatts. But despite all Ford Australia's rhetoric, this six was never going to substitute for the much-loved 5.8-litre Cleveland V8, even if it mostly had the measure of the 4.9. The flagship LTD and Fairlane suffered. The LTD had achieved its apogee with the outgoing XE-based FD with 5.8-litre V8, leather trim, moonroof and highly regarded at the time Michelin TRX wheels and tyres. The new car had none of these goodies. But Mark, it was an XF Ute, of all things, that starred in sport. <laughs> an XF Ute, who would have thought it? And also the sedan was pretty handy too, on the high banks of the Thunderdome. Although the XF Falcon was a non-starter in Group A, it did see brief active duty in the late 1980s in another form of tin top racing called Oscar at Calder Park's Thunderdome Super Speedway in Melbourne. Oscar was initially designed as a low-cost feeder category for the premier NASCAR division, but it soon became more popular than the imported American class as Aussie fans could better relate to the local Falcon and Commodore V8s. The XF Falcon was a unique Oscar hybrid powered by a thumping 351 cubic inch or 5.8 litre V8 and glued to the ground with a big front spoiler, rear wing and roof scoop. Jim Richards won first time out, which prompted other touring car top guns to have a drive, including Group A Sierra star John Bow and even the familiar 05 of Peter Brock during his darkest days in exile from Holden. The XF Falcon Oscar won numerous races in 1988 until a category switch to the latest VN Commodore and EA Falcon the following year 
soon consigned the XF Falcon 351 V8 to history. John, you know, Ford really started to lose its high performance heartland with the XF, didn't it, when you look back? They did. I mean, Max Granston, the marketing executive, and Bill Dix, the manager director, the president, they'd argue the toss about this, about how they knew that they weren't selling many V8s and all the rest. But what they didn't realise oh. was that in exchange, possibly not even in exchange for short-term market gain, oh. they were sacrificing, they were losing generations of the next younger people coming through yep. wanting to buy V8s. So they all bought used Commodore V8s. Yeah. And didn't Holden pounce. Like at the same time Ford was backing off and getting very cardigan and slippers, Holden was out there with a V8 Commodore. They set up Holden Special Vehicles with Walkinshaw in 88. Yep. They upped their a commitment to Group A touring car racing, even though they were seriously in the red. Yep. And everyone, young guys who were born in like their late 60s at that age, you know, That's it. late teens, early 20s, very impressionable age. Wow, Holden was the cool brand. Ford lost it like that. Absolutely. And uh, as Jeff Pilates made the point years later, he said that generation haunted Ford for decades. Indeed. Yeah, a lot of damage done. The XF Falcon also made history in Mexico's world famous Baja 1000 off-road race in 1987. That's when touring car racer Jim Hunter became the first Aussie to not only win his class in the bruising 1000 mile event, but also do it in a self-funded car he designed and built himself in Australia. His high-riding XF Falcon ute, which was also powered by a 351 V8, featured a light but immensely strong space frame chassis. Other innovations that stunned US rivals included independent torsion bar suspension and the auto transmission bolted directly to the diff for better weight distribution. Ideas which have since been widely copied. Hunter's victory with US co-driver Randy Salmont came after nearly 24 hours of racing non-stop through the cactus, boulders and rattlesnakes of the bruising Baja Peninsula at speeds of up to 240 kilometres an hour. In a brand new car, in its first competitive outing. It was a remarkable victory, and fittingly, Hunter's hand-built ute was acquired by the Australian Motor Racing Museum at Bathurst to preserve this unique piece of Aussie motorsport history. Remember, you can read the full road and race histories on the Shannons Club website. Hi, my name's Cesare. This is my 1986 XF Falcon S-Pack. It was bought in January of 1987. Originally, it was my dad's car. We saw this and instantly fell in love with it. He's now no longer with me, but he passed it down to me. It was his daily driver. As you see, is what we was ordered. Pretty much standard, apart from revised springs and full exhaust system. Black highlights against the white with the red stripes. And I think the, the XFs do that very well, in particular the S-Packs. The wheels, 12 sliders, I guess an 80s version. The rear tail lights and the fog lights with the grey covers on, just break it up a bit more. The interiors, power steering, no air conditioning. Just the colour scheme, the greys and the white, works well and a good balance. There's a theme going there throughout the whole car. Alloy head 2. 4.1 litre carbureted crossflow engine. It's a fantastic car to drive. This car handles a lot more comfortable than my daily. It's not about power, I think it's about the driving experience and just to drive it is a privilege every day. A 32 year old car drives fantastic. It's a great car to cruise in on the weekends with the family. It's just effortless. I've been with Shannon's more than 10 years. They were there when I needed them. My experience has been fantastic. Future plans is definitely to retain the vehicle. Being a 32 year old car, it needs a bit of a freshen up. Probably just restore some elements on the car as well, some panel work. And yeah, it'll last me for another 32 years. Shannon's National Auctions Manager Chris Borobon has dropped in 
with a market update on the XF Falcon World. Hey, John, hi. Mm, hey, interesting one, mate. Yeah, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, first Falcon since the, or first Falcon range since the XP that didn't have a V8 in it. That's so, right. Yeah. <laughs> how's it standing up in their collectability stakes? Yeah, look, we don't see much on the market at all. Through mm. the auction business, we actually don't see any XFs come through. But there are probably the odd example in, in the clubs. So uh, what, what are the highlights, though, in the range? Yeah. You look well, well, you'd have to say the Fairmont, Fairmont gear, uh, you know, top of the tree. Because there was Fairmont and Fairmont gear, That's wasn't exactly it? right. Yeah. Uh, you've also got the S pack. Uh -huh. You got the wagons and uh, also the rare Fairmont wagons, which yes, came out. It's true. 25th uh, anniversary. That's correct. Two tone yes. silver two -tone car silver with car, the yep. special wheels and stuff. That's, that's the, the sort LTD of car wheels, that yep. someone would collect. I would have thought. Yeah, but but you just don't see many around. Mm. I, you know, I think a lot of these cars we use as family cars and, and you know, fleet cars. And fleet cars. Yeah. And you know, most of it were run into the ground. So mm. I think that's probably why it is hard to find that low mileage, well kept example today. I mean, we had one as a family car, Fairmont, and mm. we covered over 400,000 kilometers in that car. But, mm. and, and that's probably the thing with that six cylinder engine. It was a very reliable engine at 4.1 litre. It was always a better engine than the, than the Holden 6, wasn't it? The, the oh, I would have to agree with that, yes. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. so from a performance angle or performance image, is the S-Pack, I guess, top of the tree in the XF range? Is that as far as you know? that, that's, uh, It's quite an interesting car, and mm. it actually had a good look to it, the XF. Yeah, the, it did. The S-Pack. It was yeah, a nice yeah, package. Yeah. yeah. So look, uh, that's definitely one to look for, because in a five-speed manual, it's actually a very rare variant. Yes. Mm. Um, yeah, it so would be rare. It's definitely yeah. one to look out for, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and Fairlane and uh, LTD, of course, the luxury models that kept going through, are they, uh, do you see many of those around? Not at all. No, no. I, I think, you know, we, we used to see a few on the road and mm. I think it's less and less these days, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks very much for joining us, Chris. Thanks, Chris. No problem, guys. And remember, you can get all the latest auction results on the Shannon's Club website. reflecting on the legacy of the XF Falcon. You know, hugely successful car. I think one of the, the biggest selling, if not the biggest selling Falcon range of all time. But when you look back on it in history, it was pivotal. In other they were very so. focused on the short term. They seized the mm. budget bottom line, but lost the hearts and minds of the petrol heads that mm. Bill Burke had cultivated so assiduously in the 60s and into the 70s. It is amazing, isn't it? Because Burke's thing was always have a hero model, you've got to have sex appeal, you've got to have muscle, the car's product has to be exciting. Well, and all the excitement came out of it in the well, NXF. Ford Australia under Bill Burke effectively invented the idea of the hero car in Australia with the Falcon GT. Oh, and, oh. and then Holden picked up that brilliant idea yeah. and ran with it. Yeah, and they were paying for it ever since. Yeah. yeah. We hope you've enjoyed reflecting on the fascinating XF Falcon and we'll catch you next time on Shannon's Club TV.